a privilege of talking to my absolute favorite author and filmmaker. So would you like to Thank introduce you. yourself? Well, my name is David Leaf. Um, I am a, a writer, a, a documentarian, uh, a professor at, at the UCLA School of Music, and uh, perhaps of greatest significance to today, the author of uh, God Only Knows, the story of Brian Wilson, the Beach Boys, and the California Myth, which is out September 22nd here in the United States. Yes, and would you like to tell us a little bit about who Brian Wilson is for those who wouldn't ne necessarily recognize the name? So when I was 19 years old, I had never heard the name Brian Wilson. And when I heard the name and then heard some of the music he was making and heard about his artistic journey, I became completely fascinated and obsessed with the idea of telling his story. And the reason I became obsessed was when I was um, 11 and 12 and 13, I had heard some of the most amazing records in the middle of the 1960s when the Beatles were at, you know, first in America. I'd heard these Beach Boys records and I loved them, but I wasn't, I wasn't compulsively buying them. I never owned a Beach Boys album, unlike with the Beatles. But when I found out that, that Brian Wilson was the composer, the arranger, the vocal arranger, the producer, and the voice of the Beach Boys that I loved, this high wail that hit me right in the heart, I wanted to know everything about him. And I think that the reason he's important is that the, the music he composed that he put out into the world has such a depth of feeling that uh, generation after generation, it seems to hit home with people. And then there are specific songs and albums that speak to what everybody goes through, regardless of, of what generation you're in. Yeah, I they think that... It's a pretty accurate summary of that. So tell a little bit more about what it is about his story, about what he's gone through that like maybe inspires some of that music. Well, I think perhaps the the, the saddest thing to know about Brian, uh, especially ironic in the fact that he made some of the happiest music of all times. After after all, the, the most successful single he produced is called Good Vibrations. But he came from a, a home where uh, the abuse of his father was, was a daily occurrence, from, from what we know historically. His father was extremely uh, tough on Brian and his younger brothers, Brian taking the brunt of it uh, as the firstborn and the oldest. And the thing about, think about knowing about that kind of abuse, which isn't apparently all that uncommon, is that I think that the music Brian created was designed to make himself feel better. And it, it, so, it coincided with the fact that it made us all feel really great too. And I think that's why his music uh, has survived. Uh, we're now at 60 years since um, the, the Beach Boys had their first major um, label release with Capitol Records. And there's a reason that people like Sean Lennon uh, describe Brian Wilson as their Bach, uh, that Quest Love talks about Brian as a classical composer. And, and the reason is very simple. Brian Wilson made music unlike anything anyone else ever did before or since. Personally, I think of him as Beethoven, but that's just me. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I always called him uh, the Mozart of, of rock and roll, um, which was both inaccurate and given that I hardly know anything about Mozart other than what I saw in the, in the movie Amadeus, kind of, kind of dumb, but not really, because there is a magic to Mozart and there's a magic to Brian Wilson that is kind of inexplicable. I had asked you to put together sort of a playlist, a very, a very magnificent playlist, which thank you very much for your excellent playlist. I wanted to talk about some of the songs on that playlist. Sure. Like 
so the, and like what they had what those songs kind of meant to to Ryan to you to what you could also discuss what that would mean for younger for an endearing way sure so one of the songs you put on that was when I grow up to be a man when I grow up to be a man was one of my favorite Beach Boys records in the in the mid 1960s and um, it has the lyric uh, will I dig the same things that turned me on as a kid? Will I look back and say, I wish I hadn't done what I did? Um, and then it asks the question in the chorus, what will I be when I grow up to be a man? And I, and I think that's a universal question. We're all wondering as as we're coming of age, as we're struggling during our teenage years, as we're trying to figure out why we're here, what we're meant to do. He's asking the question in this magnificent falsetto, uh, what will I be when I grow up to be a man? And, it, and it's, it's, the song's only about two minutes and four seconds, I think. And, and it gets the entire story across in this very short time. And on the, on the fade of the record, you hear the, the, the Beach Boys, whose harmonies he arranged, you hear them tolling the years as they go by. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And I think they get up, as, as, as the, the song fades, I think it gets up to around 32. And, and I always had this, once I understood who Brian Wilson was, I had this kind of naive dream that when he got to the age of 32, all of his problems would be healed, that this record was somehow prophetic. And sadly, at, at the age of 32, Brian Wilson was going through some of his most difficult times. So w while, the, while the music was magnificent and still is, there, there was nothing prophetic about it. But, but, but the question is a timeless one. What will I be when I grow up to be a man or, or a woman? It's something that, because I just turned 30 just a few weeks ago, and so... That's that was a song that I was listening to a lot, like in the days leading up to that, because suddenly it's like, oh, I'm really an adult now. Like I was obviously for some time before, but now I'm really an adult. <laughs> well, wait, wait till you get to my age, when 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 there's no question that you're well past the halfway point. Um, it, it's 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 intimidating, but. What Brian Wilson did to me, did for me, was it gave me a, a sense of purpose. That when I read about him in 19, when I was 19 years old, and I was I had started as a journalism major in college, and I and we had studied uh, a legendary broadcaster named Edward R. Murrow, and in studying his Edward R. Murrow's work. What I realized that one could be a journalist, but also advocate for a positive change. And for whatever set of complex reasons, I chose Brian Wilson as the story I wanted to tell because I believed like a crusader. It was my mission to, to kind of grab the world by the shirt collar and say, you've got to listen to this guy. You've got to listen to this story. This is really important. And I don't feel any differently today than, than I did 50 years ago. I'm just, I'm just more mature about it. We'll talk a little more about the book itself later, but that is something, though, that teasing that discussion a little, that I actually really enjoyed in that because, like, the book has – your right your youthful writings when you were what in your mid 20s then when you the first edition came out so all that passion and vigor for that that missionary fervor is all there and it's really nice that like really good seeing like in your late in your latest update in the 2022 update where at the age you are now it's that love for ryan and for your passion for him is no less there it's just that it's matured into, I believe I heard you use this term in another interview, an elder statesman looking back. <laughs> well, I, there's no question. I'm I am looking back um, at, at this truly unbelievable, miraculous experience that I had. 
but I know you want to talk about the book a little bit later, so I won't, I won't get into the kind of the miracle story behind the book yet. Now, I wanted to f- first continue our discussion about the music itself first, and then, sure. then we'll get to the book. But yeah, the next one on your list is one of my personal favorites, In My Room, which for me, that was a huge song for me to discover because I grew up in a very, very unhappy situation too. And that was one of the songs that made me feel that like that Brian's music was safe for me, like a safe place for me to, to go to. And I think, I think that's part of the part of, of the gift of this music is that we all hear it. We all relate to it in a different way and it makes us feel differently. But a song like in my room, is very, very special. I think it was my first favorite of his. And in, in the book, Barry Gibb, Sir Barry Gibb, the, the, the oldest brother of the Bee Gees, the primary creative force of that group, who adores and worships and, and admires and looks up to Brian Wilson, in his essay, he talks about In My Room as a special song for him which he heard when he was growing up in Australia, um, you know, in the early 1960s as well. So, so the music has a, has a worldwide reach and it, it affects people in such a powerful way that, you know, there's a place where I can go and tell my secrets too in my room. Now, I'm not singing it, but, you know, think of those words. Do my scheming and my dreaming lie awake and pray? I mean, it, it's it's such a a, a, a simple, sweet uh, notion that, but an important one. That there's one place where you're safe, where you can close the door, and the outside world can't get at you. It's beautiful, and as I said, that's one thing that. I think that for those of us who have grown up in that in those unhappy circumstances, I think that's one of those things about Brian's own story that can speak to us that here's somebody who gets it and who wants to offer a safe place for us, even he, if we he, don't always have that. He, he, he gets it. Brian gets it because he's been through every imaginable horror other than work. You know, he he did he wasn't on a battlefield, but he was on an emotional battlefield with a, a series of abusers, starting with his father, and yet somehow managed what many of us struggle to do uh, to find a way out of that in any way, like an out an artistic outlet, in, or in any way that's find anything that's fulfilling in that. I think the music is so powerful and so strong specifically because he went through such painful uh, experiences. I, th- I think he, he, he found his solace at the piano and he poured his pain literally through his fingers onto the keyboard. And it came, it came out with these sometimes mournful, some, so, sometimes heartbreaking, sometimes joyful melodies. And that brings us to the next two tracks on your um, on the playlist you'd put together. Both of them were from Pet Sounds, which is just absolutely. If any album could be described as perfection, I would call that Pet Sounds perfection. Well, Unparalleled. Pet, Pet, Pet Sounds is an album, unfortunately titled, but but um, filled with. I say that because. Record retailers in 1966 thought between the title and the cover of, of the Beach Boys at the Zoo that it must be a children's album. But, but the, the way I've described Pet Sounds is, is the emotional autobiography of, of its author. Um, Brian composed, arranged, produced the entire record. Um, he is the primary lead vocalist on the record. There are two instrumentals that are just otherworldly, one of which he wrote hoping it would be a theme for a James Bond movie. But when Brian talks, um, uh, when Brian sings, don't talk, put your head on my shoulder, 
you you feel all the love of of a teenage romance. When Brian sings, I just wasn't made for these times, it's a staggering self-awareness that that he feels out of time. All of us have felt like, what are we doing here? Do we where do I fit in? Where do we belong? And here it is expressed in this amazing song. And 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 some of the lyrics of it are very simple. Sometimes I feel very bad. Now that doesn't sound like artistic genius, but when you combine it with the melody and the harmony and the instrumental backing, it's it's staggering in its power. And in its honesty. Just to be able to admit that musically, like, and especially like we're all like the default answer when someone asks, how are you? Oh, fine, fine. Even if you're clearly falling apart, it's so to be able to admit that in a song, like in the song that it's just the, the emotional vulnerability there is, it's really something. Brian was never concerned about admitting his emotional vulnerability through his music. You can hear it going all the way back to the lonely sea and surfer girl. It, it comes through regardless of what the lyric is. There's, there's a quality of, of, of revelation in what he says musically that, that hits the listener. So even if you don't speak English, if you don't know what he's singing about, the music is going to touch you. What's, what's uh, interesting is that at the same time he's singing, I just wasn't made for these times, he's making an album and an album statement that was the most powerful pop album of, its, of, its re, of the year of its release, that when the Beatles heard it, and, and I, I imagine we have a few people who are watching this who are Beatles fans, I had the, the honor of, of interviewing and working with Sir George Martin several times, the Beatles producer. And he said to me that Pet Sounds was so impactful on the Beatles that from their point of view, the question was, how could we equal this? Forget about bettering it. And so he described Sgt. Pepper, which, which was at the time regarded as the greatest rock album of all time. He, he said, quote, uh, Sergeant Pepper is our attempt, with an accent on the word attempt, to equal Pet Sounds. And when asked to describe Brian, he said, if I had to choose one living genius of popular music, it would be Brian Wilson. Now, this is the man who worked most closely with John Lennon and Paul McCartney during the, the years the Beatles were together. So for him to regard Brian and Pet Sounds in that regard, it gives you an indication of how big the impact he made was as he's singing, I just wasn't made for these times. He was still having an enormous impact on his times. And I may also mention that Pet Sounds was the music that really brought me into falling deeply in love with all the rest of Brian's music. And I'd happen I'd to have seen the movie Love and Mercy quite randomly one night. And a whole, a whole night of, like, of insomniac worryings about a, a pr situation that was pressing down on my life. And I happened to find that, turn it on. Oh, this looks interesting. Oh, yeah, I wanted to see it five years ago when it came out. <laughs> then I didn't. And that led to a whole magical night of looking up everything I possibly could about pet sounds. And I was hooked after that because it's so powerful because it's so astonishingly beautiful and touches so deeply at one's heart. It, it does. And, and I, I, think, I think the key uh, for anyone who hasn't heard Pet Sounds is to not think of it as a Beach Boys album, but think of it as, as Brian Wilson's first solo album. Because while the Beach Boys sing background uh, on it, there's not a lot of Beach Boys participation in the making of it. He uses their voices as, as an instrument. So, so if, if, if we think of it as, as the work of an emotional singer-songwriter, uh, no different than Taylor Swift, 
this was Brian Wilson at, at, you know, a very vulnerable time in his life and career. He's 23 years old and he's spilling his soul onto vinyl. It's just absolutely, absolutely incredible. And yeah, like there, I never could go too many days without listening to pet sounds, even for, even the course of about three and a half years since I first started to really get into his music. I can't go more than a day or two without listening to pet sounds. It's just become so much a part of my own life. <laughs> I, I understand. I mean, I understand to the, to the extent that in, uh, in the mid 1990s, uh, Brian and I, uh, had a conversation and I suggested doing a box set that focused just on the album Pet Sounds. Imagine a four CD box set, just about one album. I mean, that's, that's how big a deal Pet Sounds was. And it, and it, and it was, it, it got a Grammy nomination. I mean, it was a, it, it, the, the release of the Pet Sounds sessions was, was historic in, in people reassessing uh, Pet Sounds place in musical history. Oh yes, I have that box set. It's phenomenal, and it's just incredible how that really breaks it down into whole new levels of appreciation. You get the the, the isolated vocals, you get the backing tracks. It's just phenomenal. It's a whole new. It's like a whole new experience every time you listen to those. Yeah, it's it's a great rabbit hole to go down once once you've experienced Pet Sounds and that has touched you, then you have the joy of of, of going deeper into it. And the books you wrote for the for that box set were phenomenal too. Incredible Thank resources. Thank you. So next on the list was this whole world. Tell me a little bit about that song and what that's meant to you. This this whole world is is another example of Brian's ability in just a couple of minutes to 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 create a kaleidoscope of musical emotion and take the listener around the world with harmonic brilliance that, you know, I don't have the, the musical vocabulary to, to really properly describe, but it, it, it gives you a sense of, of you know, once in a, in, a, in a great documentary about Brian called I Just Wasn't Made for These Times, he said, once in a while your soul, want, your soul comes out to play and this whole world is one of those songs where it's clear that, that Brian's soul came out to play. And, and he, you know, late at night, I think about the love of this whole world. And it's, it's just, it's an example of Brian. There's, a, there's a, a childlike innocence and beauty to all of his work that despite the pain of his, of his life, he's, he, he's never lost that. He, he, he remains in touch with the muse that created this music because he needed it and he wanted to share it with the world. With, in this case, with this whole world. Stunning song too, like, and everywhere I go, I see love. Like, I love that. There, that always tugs at my heart, the way he sings that too. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful piece. It's it, it, for, on first listen. It sounds maybe a little simple, but when you hear the music and the harmonies and, and the way the vocals, the lead vocal comes in and out, and the conclusion, it's just and you know it, it it's it's brilliant. And to realize that he could go through all that he went through up to that point, and and not be jaded and still be able to see love even when so little was shown to him even up to that point and that seems to be um i don't know if the curse is the right world word it it, it just seems to be his fate to to be able to give love musically to the world and not be able to receive it and anywhere near the volume he's given it. I mean, he just, he gives so much. Easily the heaviest song on the list you've given, but one of the ones that have been most important to me personally was Till I Die. Tell me a little bit about that. 
1971, um, when I first read about Brian Wilson in a, in a monumental two-part Rolling Stone cover story about Brian and the Beach Boys, it, it inspired me to, to, to buy the, the new Beach Boys album called Surf's Up that was out at the time in the fall of 1971. And um, there were two songs in particular on the album that, that spoke volumes to me. The article was, a, a large part of the article was about this album called Smile that as of 1971 had never been finished and never been released. And that the kind of the centerpiece song of this album was something called Surf's Up, which became the title song of, of their of the Beach Boys release in, in the fall of 71. And so when I played it the album for the first time, the last two songs on the album are Till I Die and Surf's Up. And when I heard Surf's Up, um, it exceeded my expectations. From from reading the article. I had expected something mind blowing, and this was even beyond that. And and um, in life, very few things exceed expectation. I mean, it's it's really rare. Usually, th things oh yeah, that was great, that was good, but it's like it's like going to see a sequel to your favorite movie. You know, it's is it ever as good as you're hoping it's going to be? Not not too often. So so surfs up did did that it was oh my goodness if smile was going to be a whole bunch of music like this smile was as great as as this article says the song before it till i die was a brand new song before we get to the lyric of it just the melody and the harmony and the vocal when i heard that it's like well, wait a second the brian wilson that's being described in this article made this record he wrote the song he wrote the the melody, he wrote the lyric, he sings it. And it was like, he has, all of his talents are still intact. Now you take the lyric of Till I Die, which is just heartbreaking. It's, it's, it's the lyric of somebody who has basically given up. I'm, I'm a cork on the ocean floating on the raging sea how deep is the ocean? You know, it, it, you know, these things I'll be until I die. I mean, it's somebody who, who has just accepted their fate, doesn't think there's anything they can do about it, and in the meantime has expressed it in this magnificent, magnificent musical piece. To me, it was like, you know, a decade later, it was in my room, except really serious in terms of its subject matter. And... Like for me, like that, look, both of those songs you mentioned have a very personal connection for me that one dark day quite literally saved my life. But it's, it's the, the, again, the honesty, the incredible honesty of being able to put those feelings out into the world to, for someone to be able to grab onto that as a life raft later would quite literal and quite literally be changed by the, a song like that. Well, it's, it's, it's a testament, again, to the power uh, of feeling he infuses into, into his, his music that it was recorded in 1971, and you heard it around 2019, and, and it, it hits you just as hard then as it hit me in 1971. It's, it, it's, if you open your ears to it, 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 it is honest it's heartbreaking there's one lyric that goes i'm a leaf on a windy day pretty soon i'll be blown away how long will the wind blow until i die and that's a it's such a sad lyric and, and one day at rehearsal when when brian and his band were rehearsing the song i i went up to him and and thinking i was being funny i said i'm that leaf on a windy day he, he didn't think it was all that funny. But uh, the, the, the idea that, that Brian and his band performed that song live, that he could go on stage in front of thousands of people, and, and it's almost like opening a vein and, and letting your heart, you know, your heart on your sleeve, all those cliches about what art is supposed to be, till I die is what art is supposed to be. 
it's it's like you know Van Gogh's ear being cut off. That's what that song is in in Brian's body of work. That's incredible that he performs that. That's... Even more incredible is there was an original lyric to it that we never heard and never will hear, because when he played it for the Beach Boys, their response was this song was too depressing to put on a Beach Boys album. So he erased that lyric and vocal and recorded what's on the on the record. It's it's kind of mind boggling, but mind boggling to imagine what was he saying before that, because the one that's the one that was released is pretty depressing. Yes, that is wow. Like just to think that there it could be even more vivid than that. Because I would find say that what he wrote there is stunningly clear about what he was feeling. It, it it's definitely clear, and it, and it's 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 thrilling to me that it it uh, made it onto record. So the next two songs on your playlist jump quite a bit into his like to, toward the first album of his solo career, and. Would you like to talk a little bit about those, Love and Mercy and Melt Away? Uh, Love and Mercy and Melt Away are, are two more recent songs that um, I think are, are, are very significant in, in, in Brian Wilson's life and career because they came out at a time when, when people thought his career was over. So in 1988, Brian Wilson put out his first official solo album. And the the first track on the, on the album is called Love and Mercy. And I've always, I love the song and I love the message in this song. Brian Wilson sang it at the encore of his concert, probably for 20 years. It would be the final, final song of the concert. And what was interesting about it to me, as more you hear things, the more you start to interpret them. The, 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 the lyric is at the end is, love and mercy is what you need tonight. And I, I feel like it, he was singing it to himself. Love and mercy is what I need tonight. And it's just such a beautiful message, love and mercy. I mean, what, what more do we need in the world than love and mercy? So I love the message of that. The, the reason I picked Melt Away, which is also on that first solo album, is, is it, it sounds as great as any composition he's ever written. And it's, you know, it, it's just a great, great song. So I picked that as kind of representative of, of Brian Wilson's creative renaissance, which began with that 1988 solo album and continued uh, right through uh, an album he put out at the end of 2021 called at my piano yeah the his 1988 album like had to grow on me a little because like when i had first approached i hadn't really learned yet to put aside like the baggage of the whole story of that because that came at a very awkward time (laughs) to say the least downright bad time but very awkward like as far as trying to understand how to separate the art from what was going on around it and it took some time but like lately it really really grew on me like there like is no bad song on that album Uh, well it's it's when i first heard it i you know this has has to do with expectations i thought it was going to be brian playing and singing a dozen or so of his favorite songs so I thought, this will be interesting. It'll be like getting demos of his greatest hits. And so the first time through, it was like, oh, he's not singing. He's just playing. Oh, I was piano. referring to his 1988 album. The, the 1988 album. Well, there's a whole, it's, there's such a psychodrama about that album that I had to write an entire chapter in the, in the update of the book, but just about the making of that album. It's, it's, it could be a book all by itself because of, of what was going on in his life at that time. He was in the clutches of, of a man who used, used the word doctor in front of his name, but he was not a doctor. 
Yes. That that whole story, like we'll put that aside for another conversation. Okay. Because that's an entirely different. It it just go, it goes it, it goes to the fact that Brian Wilson overcomes everything. That's really what the issue is. Brian Wilson, um, he describes the nine years that this doctor, so called doctor, had control of his life as like being in prison. And yet during that time, he made what I consider to be his best solo album. So this is a man who can overcome everything and anything to make beautiful music. And that's kind of the definition of an artist. Yeah, it's absolutely astounding. And it, you have one of the songs that didn't make your playlist, but is just absolutely as mind-blowing as anything I have ever heard anywhere. Rio Grande, of course. <laughs> well, I didn't include Rio Grande on my playlist. Rio Grande is the last uh, track on Brian's first solo album. It's not really a song. It's a suite of, of, of musical motifs and pieces that were assembled to tell a, to, to tell a story and take us on a journey. It could, have, it could have been an entire album all by itself. It was like a miniature version of Smile on, on the album. So it's, 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 it's one of my, if not my favorite cuts on the album, but as a song, it's, 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 it's unexpected to say the least. It, it was just a, a triumph. It's incredible. You can add it to my list. <laughs> my list changes every day. My list changes every hour. No, it, it, I know what you mean because I was asked recently to make two volumes of play, like a two volume playlist of my favorite of Ryan Wilson and Beach Boy songs. And I, I'm like, that was really difficult to do. I had to pick 12 songs per list and it was impossible. I was recently told I can make a volume three. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but it's really hard to choose favorites or choose the best of or choose any in any kind of categorical way because there's just so much that he's done. Well, there's 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 no reason to to choose favorites anymore. You know, people will ask me, what's your favorite Beatles song? Well, that's actually easy for me. Hey Jude is my favorite Beatles song. It's the one I can listen to endlessly. If you ask me my favorite Elton John song or Sting song or REM song, you know, I can generally come up with, you know, a short list. Brian's body of work, it just kind of defies belief because it went through so, so many changes so quickly. It's, it, it's similar in that regard to the Beatles. And, and uh, because it, Brian did his work under the name the Beach Boys, it got caught up in the, uh, kind of the um, stereotype of the Beach Boys as this surf and car and girls on the beach group, whereas Brian's music really had nothing to do with any of that. He was writing church music. He just happened to be talking about California girls. Oh, I like that analogy. <laughs> Very clever. Very true. I'll skip for a moment the next one on your list because I think that will be a good transition to talking about your book. But you, so you also and and we already you already mentioned like about good vibrations how that was his most successful. So is there anything more you'd wanted to say about good vibrations? Well, good vibrations was the reason good vibrations was so celebrated by the people in the music industry is because it was unlike anything that anyone had ever done in popular music before. What uh, I would call, it was modular recording. He recorded that song in pieces and then put it all together. And the Smile album, which became kind of the holy grail for Brian Wilson fans of my generation, as well as the next generation, as well as the next one, as well as yours, was going to be an entire album in that style. And Rio Grande, which you referred to a little bit earlier, was a return to that kind of modular recording. So, so Good Vibrations, uh, even though it has a verse and a chorus 
and and it's there's nothing traditional about it. It's it's very very different. It was also longer than almost anything that had ever been a hit record at that point. Um, it in in the in the vernacular of the time, it blew minds, uh, including the Beatles. It was like everybody was like, "What is that? What has he done?" Sail on sailor. Tell me about that. That's quite a different song from. Sail on sailor was I included on the list because. After I had become obsessed with Brian Wilson in, in 1971, I then began to buy new Beach Boys albums with the hope that there would be songs like Till I Die and Surf's Up on them. And, and I was invariably disappointed for many years. Sail on Sailor is the, is the notable exception. And it, again, it's as if Brian is singing to himself, sail on, sailor, regardless of what you're going through, sail on, just keep going. Whatever storms, you're, you're in a lifeboat, the, 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 the sea swells are, are rising, just sail on. And it, it's, it's a great song. It was a great record. It had a, gr- a terrific lead vocal by a South African, a black South African by the name of Blondie Chaplin, who of late has toured with Brian Wilson's band in 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 that era? He had he was a member. He and Ricky Fatar had joined the Beach Boys. Uh, we want to talk about breaking stereotypes. They had, they had two black South Africans in the Beach Boys, uh, 72, 73, 74. So it it Sail on Sailor just represents the last great Beach Boys record before things really went downhill. And I could say from experience, seeing Blondie perform that song is a trip and a half. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a real rock and roller, we put it that way. Yeah, that was, that's, it's really something. It was funny because I'd gotten to see that, like, I answered like this last tour and got to see can perform that. And somebody was like asking me, like someone sitting around me was asking, like, who is that? I'm like, how, how long do you have for me to explain Bonnie Chaplin? <laughs> I'm not qualified for this. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about music is, is it, like any kind of art form, it doesn't really matter who it is or their backstory. All that matters is, does the music hit you? And, and if, if Brian's music hits you, as it did you, as it, as it affected me, then we want to know more. We become obsessed. And uh, this was the grand obsession of my life, if you will. I relate to that feeling of obsession, certainly. It's been my obsession, too, the last few years. So hence why I get to have this wonderful conversation. <laughs> And the last song you had put on this list, Don't Worry Baby. Don't Worry Baby is is a classic example of of Brian's mid-60s brilliance at its best. It's a ballad. He sings. It's an amazing vocal from him. And unless you listen carefully, you don't even know what it's about. It's actually about a car race. But... I think the reason I, I put it on the list is the last lyric. Don't worry, baby, everything will turn out all right. And, and I think that's a kind of a fitting way to end a, a Brian Wilson playlist. Everything will turn out all right. Didn't turn out perfectly. It turned out pretty darn all right, though. Sometimes all right is all we can hope for. Well, in Brian's case, uh, it, 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 was, it was better than all right. But I, I don't know that he ever sang a better lead vocal than, than Don't Worry Baby. It is beautiful. So there is one song on this list, a very notable song that I had skipped to come back to because that will transition us into talking about the book. Okay. And that is the title of the book, God Only Knows. Tell me about the song itself and then, if you will, about how you came to that title. Well, the song, the song God Only Knows is, is probably uh, the most famous song from Pet Sounds. It's probably the song that, that crosses 
uh, when, when new generations discover Brian Wilson, God only knows, I think is the kind of the entryway. It's, it's quite an unusual song, a, a, quite an unusual love song in the sense that the opening lyric is, I may not always love you. So it's kind of like you almost jump back in your seat. What do you mean, I may not always love you? That's, that's not the first thing you want to hear, but the next line, you know, as long as there are stars above you. So it's, 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 it's making it pretty clear that, yes, I'm going to love you forever. So it's, it's a very different way of expressing eternal love. It was controversial at the time to use the word God in the title. Very controversial. It's a very short song, actually. It only has uh, three Beach Boys on it, Brian, his brother Carl, and uh, Bruce Johnston. It has, it opens with a French horn solo. I mean, you know, how many rock and roll records open with a French horn solo? I mean, it's just everything, everything about it is like, is surprising. It, it ends with a, with a, a round of the three of, of really, I think it's just Brian and Bruce singing the phrase, God only knows what I'd be without you over and over again. And there's, the message is quite simple. Now, the, 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 the question might be, who is, who is the song directed to? Is it directed to another person or is it directed to God? Uh, is, he, is he expressing his eternal love for, for uh, a deity? Or for for somebody who's more earthbound, so it, it raises a lot of questions. The fact when I interviewed Paul McCartney in 1970 for the CD release of Pet Sounds, he singled out "God Only Knows" not only as his favorite song from the album, but perhaps his favorite song of all time. When I was assembling the the new material for this edition of the book, for the 2022 edition of the book, which I named God Only Knows, uh, I asked Paul McCartney to write something for the book, Sir Paul McCartney, and he sent a, an email where he talked about the song God Only Knows and how it would have it was, it demonstrated the genius of Brian Wilson. So there's a lot of reasons why the book is called God Only Knows. One is because of the song. Two really is because of the universal love of the song. Anybody who's heard it has gone, oh my goodness. And by, when I say anybody, I'm including like Gustavo Dudamel, who's the, 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 uh, the, head, the, the chief conductor for the LA Philharmonic. Quest love. I mean, every time people come to Brian Wilson's music, when they hear God Only Knows, it's, it brings them in. They realize, okay, this is not the Beach Boys. The Beach Boys may be on the label, but that's not what this is about. So, so it's, it's got, you know, those qualities. And then the thing about God only knows as an expression. If somebody says, says, why did this happen? You might say, God only knows. And it's relevant in this case, especially relevant in this case, because Brian Wilson is, in a sense, inexplicable. He's unknowable. Behind his eyes, there's so much going on. And sometimes he'll tell you, and sometimes he won't. But most of all, he shares what's going on in his music. So God Only Knows seemed like both, both a song that belongs on the list a and a title for the book, because it's an admission. I've written more words about Brian Wilson, I think, than anybody else dead or alive. I've, I've thought about him. I've talked about him. I've spent countless hours with him. And... There is something about it that just you cannot explain. Beautiful. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the book itself, like the structure of it. So like it was first published in 1978 and updated in 1985. Now there's the 2022 update. Tell me a little bit more about what each of those phases of the story meant to you? Well, you know, in 1971, when I first discovered Brian Wilson and read about him and, and really, for whatever reason, 
and I guess psychologists or psychiatrists might be able to explain that. I, I, he became the subject of a mission that I defined when I was in college. And I said, I'm going to move to California, uh, write a book about Brian Wilson, become his friend and help him finish Smile. That was the compulsion with which uh, I was driven. So I had this, I had the thought, I verbalized it when I still lived in the East, when I, where I grew up. I moved to California in the fall of 1975. Within 36 hours of arriving in California, I met Brian's br brother, Dennis, just by accident. I ran into him on the street. And I, I'm, I'm not shy, I'm, I'm confident. And I walked up to Dennis and I said, Hi, Dennis, my name is David Leaf. I just moved to California to write a book about your brother. And he just he laughed and he said, good luck. I mean, it was just it was just like it was a preposterous notion. Almost three years to the date of that meeting, that accidental meeting with Dennis, the book was in the bookstores. And there's a long convoluted story as to how I got a book contract, but it all goes to something that is important for all of us in life is intention. Is taking responsibility for what we do and how we do it. And I made this the focus of my life, the primary focus of my life, not the sole focus, but doing that book, writing about Brian was extremely important to me. And the 1978 book was written as a journalist, as a missionary, as somebody who was obsessed with Brian, as somebody who wanted the world to be obsessed with Brian. The 1985 edition updated that book. If we go back to what I had said in, in 1971, 72, I'm going to move to California, write a book about Brian Wilson, become his friend and help him finish Smile. Well, the book came out and I became his friend. So the 1985 edition was written the update to that edition was written by somebody who was both a journalist and a, a relatively new friend in his world who was watching events unfold with great concern. Now here we are 37 years after the 1985 edition and, you know, things have sort of run their course, if you will. I miraculously, unbelievably, unexpectedly, in 2004, not only did Brian finish Smile, but I made a film about it at his request, Beautiful Dreamer, Brian Wilson and the Story of Smile. So I was, in a sense, involved in helping him finish it and there to document it as it happened, which does it in, in the rational world makes absolutely no sense. But what it makes sense is in the world of, of how we live our lives. And I made a lot of choices. You know, every day you make, you decide what you're going to do. How are you going to spend your day? What are you going to, what's going to be your priorities? And working with Brian Wilson, writing about Brian Wilson was a priority for me. Sometimes it was a sole priority, but it takes that kind of will and intention and eventually a critical mass of people gathered around Brian and showered him with so much love that there was nothing for him to do but finish Smile. He, he said to me, I have to do it. So our obsession became his compulsion. He had to do it. And I was there when he did it and watched, watched it as it started, almost fell apart, came together. I watched with the courage he walked up on the stage and presented it to an audience. And I watched as the audience gave him a standing ovation, which went on and on and on. I watched, and I, I, I say this with no exaggeration, he took a deep sigh, he stepped back as the, as the applause washed over him, and it was as if demons were flying out of his head. That's how big a deal it was. 
and from everything after that, our, our dream had been if Brian finishes Smile, well, that will free him to make more great music. And it did work that way. A few years after Smile, he premiered a new rock opera called That Lucky Old Son in London at the same theater where he had premiered um, Brian Wilson Presents Smile. And he went on to make a great album of Gershwin covers and, and lots of other terrific music because he no longer had this albatross hanging around him. And it, it was it's a real triumph of, of, of the human spirit. I know that's a cliche, but that's that's what I was eyewitness to and participant with. It's very inspi it's a very inspiring story. And so when you ask about the difference between the books, both the 78 book and the 85 edition end with some real concern and sadness, like this is not a happy ending. And, and the new edition can end, on, can end with, it's a celebration of what's happened since 1985. So you're getting two books in one. You're getting the original book essentially unchanged. So people who weren't around to buy it can read it as it was. And then you're getting this massive update, which is almost, it's over half the length of the original book. So you're getting like two books in one. And that's the incredible thing about, about the book, that it is unchanged. Like I wasn't even alive back in 78 and when, or when any of this was happening. And as I said, I even like for the stuff that happened in my lifetime, like I wasn't really aware tragically until a few years ago and I missed out on so much but to be able to get to read the original book as it as it was written more or less like I it's it's like having a living document of what of the experience of that time and that's of so much value to those of us who are coming up that like it's there's so many, so many different sources out there of documentaries of other, a few other books that have been written that are some quite good, some less good. <laughs> but um, the, like this one is phenomenal and actually putting us in that sense of what that, what all that really felt like to live through it that time and to know the story as it unfolded. It's, it's a pretty remarkable story. He's, he's a remarkable man and artist. And, you know, I'm proud to call him friend. I'm proud that um, he uh, invited me into his world, that we were able to work together on, on quite a few projects. And, uh, and I feel like this book, you know, I, I refer to, uh, you know, th there was a review of the 1985 edition um, in a rock magazine, they called it the indispensable Bible of Beach Boys fanatics. So I think, I think in a way, not to be sacrilegious, of, of the original book is kind of the Old Testament that I wrote about Brian. In, in that, I wrote, I wrote it by talking to the people who knew him best before I moved to California, starting with his mother. So it, it has kind of the books of the Brian Wilson Bible, with, if you will, the book of Audrey Wilson, and, and then his, a lot of his collaborators and people who worked with him and people who were his friends. This, the, the new edition, we'll call it the New Testament, if, if you will. And it's primarily told through my eyes, what I experienced with him and my memories and how, it, how I felt about what was going on. So, so it's, it's, it is living, it is indeed living history because I lived it. And I think that's definitely an important perspective for those of us who come to the story so much later to, to have that resource. So I'm so grateful that it's back in print. I was, it was impossible to find that affordably, like but the whole time I've been searching and. Thank you. It's, it's really great to have it back. It's great for me to have it back in print because for at least 25 years, people have asked me for a copy of it and I, I had no copies to give out. And uh, I remember in 1999, when Brian played a, his first tour 
uh, he stopped, he was playing the Beacon Theater in New York. And uh, I, I had a lot of, I'm from New York, so I had a lot of friends I was saying hello to. And and a young a young man, younger than, younger than you, probably 21 or 22, came up to me very excited. And he had found a copy of my book on eBay. And he, and he, and he said, Mr. Leaf, I, I, I got your book for five hundred dollars, and I blurted out, "I'm so sorry," because the notion that he had to pay five hundred dollars was really upsetting for me. And the book sold for seven dollars and ninety-eight cents when it came out, so it was like this is, and so I really wanted the book to exist in the world again, and, and I'm really happy that it does. I'm proud that it that it does, and uh, I'm glad that. Um, somebody who's you know more than half my age, meaning you, found it worth worth reading, and I hope other people who are new to the story, new to the new to the music, uh, in, also discover you know th- this remarkable journey that that he went on. It's a phenomenal book. I can't thank you enough for writing it for helping it to like for updating it and and for all that you've done to help Brian like thank you on behalf of all of us younger people who come to the story as it's as it stands now thank you thank you I got as much if not more from my relationship with Brian um, than, than anything it, it it's a, it's 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 perhaps the defining uh, relationship of my life Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me, and I really, really appreciate this. This is such a thrill. Always happy to talk talk about Brian Wilson and his music. So, so thank you for inviting me. Thank you.